Happy Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I've gotten all dressed up for you with a tie and everything. But boy, it's hard not being with you all today. Easter Sunday is a special time. But let's stay the course. Let's do everything we can do right now, everything within our own power to flatten the curve so that we can come together soon. And boy, that first Sunday is going to be a celebration to remember. The story is told of a young boy named Philip who was born with Down syndrome. Philip attended a church where they had a third grade Sunday school class with several eight-year-old boys and girls. And typical of that age, the children didn't really accept Philip with all of his differences. But because he had a great teacher, a great creative teacher, these kids began to care about Philip and accept him as part of the group, although not fully. Do you remember in the 70s and 80s, you could buy pantyhose that were called legs and they came in these uh, plastic egg cartons? Maybe you can still get them. I don't know. I haven't bought pantyhose in a long time. <laughs> well, the Sunday after Easter was a nice spring day and this Sunday school teacher brought these little pantyhose containers to church and gave one to each kid, told them to go outside and find some symbol of new life. They would then come back in and share their symbols, opening the containers one by one. While the kids left, they ran around the church. It was chaos everywhere. Then they eventually returned to the classroom and placed their little containers on the table. The children surrounded the teacher and one by one, she opened the eggs. And inside were the typical things for new life. One had a flower, a butterfly, a leaf. And every time an egg was opened, the class would ooh and ah. Well, they got to the last egg and the teacher opened it and there was nothing inside. And the children said, that's stupid. That's not fair. Someone didn't do the right job. Well, Philip spoke up and said, that egg's mine. They never do anything right, they said. He said, I did do it right. It's empty. The tomb was empty. Well, of course, everyone realized that Philip nailed the assignment. And from then on, Philip was a full member of the class. He died not long afterward from an infection that most children would have just shrugged off. Well, at the funeral, this class of eight-year-olds marched up to the altar, not with flowers, but with their Sunday school teacher, each to lay an empty pantyhose egg on the casket. Easter is all about celebrating emptiness. That sounds quite strange, doesn't it? When you think about it, who in their right mind celebrates emptiness? Well, that's what I want to look at this morning. So what does that word mean, empty? Well, it has a couple of definitions. The first definition relates to a person's emotional state. It doesn't necessarily have to do with a thing, but more with a person. Let me read from Ruth chapter 1. Ruth begins by addressing her mother-in-law who's trying to convince her to return to her family of origin after the death of her husband and two sons, one of who, whom was Ruth's husband. It says, Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Naomi is a woman who knew sorrow. In the span of a few years, she had lost her home, lost her husband, lost her two sons. She originally left home because of a famine and now returned home, Scripture says, an empty woman. 
She felt as though she had nothing. Her emotions were drained and she felt empty. That's that first definition. Definition number two says empty means void, nothingness. A place can be void of something. If you hold a bowl and it's empty, it is lacking something that could go in that bowl. If my car is running on empty, it means I'm out of gas. You can have an empty stomach. Food is meant to be there, but you have an empty stomach and you're hungry. I'll give you an example from scripture. Remember when Joseph was attacked by his brothers and thrown into the pit? Scripture tells us that that pit was actually a cistern designed to hold water, but it was empty. There was no water in it. And this is the second definition that I want to look at this morning. Easter is a celebration of emptiness, an empty grave. Every community in the world has graves. Tombs, mausoleums, cemeteries. Some of these graves are major tourist sites because of the importance of the person living there. One of the times, one of the many times I went to Los Angeles, uh, I had a day to play tourist. So I wanted to go, you know, to the typical LA places. I wanted to go to Hollywood Boulevard or Beverly Hills, Rodeo Drive, even just one of the beaches. But the person I was traveling with had found this tourist company whose specialty was taking people to the graves of famous actors and actresses, especially from the golden age of screen, the silver screen. Well, needless to say, we went our separate ways. I had no desire at all to go and look at a bunch of graves. Ain't nobody got time for that. Some graves have taken on historical and cultural significance because they're great pieces of architecture. Places like the pyramids and the tombs of Egypt, Taj Mahal in India, Moscow's Red Square where Lenin's tomb is. Think of some of the tombs of the Incas and the Aztecs. Even Westminster Abbey, this great church in London, is considered important because it's the burial place of some very important people. All of these tombs, as well as the graves of our own loved ones, are important for who they contain. But I want to say that the most sacred, the most important tomb, the one that's had the greatest impact in our world so far, is a simple unmarked cave somewhere near Jerusalem. And this grave is so important, not because of the remains of the person buried there, but because it's empty. The person who occupied it, Jesus, a humble carpenter from Nazareth, is no longer there. In fact, he had a really short lease on the place, only three days. Three days for the humble carpenter to rise from the dead and check out of the tomb. And now that grave stands empty. And because of that tomb, the world has never been the same. But for many people on that first Easter morning, the world was no different than it had always been. Except for a handful of women and the remaining disciples, no one really cared about this humble carpenter from Nazareth. But gradually, over the past 2,000 years, have followers, his followers have grown in number until today over half of the world's population considers themselves of the Christian faith. Well, how, how do we explain that? Max Lucado wrote this excellent book. It's called He Chose the Nails. I have a copy after this virus is all over and we're back to normal. If anyone wants to borrow this, I have a copy. In his book, He Chose the, he Chose the Nails, Max writes this. Jesus was a backwater peasant. He never wrote a book, never held an office. He never journeyed more than 200 miles from his hometown. Friends left him, one betrayed him. Those he helped forgot him. Prior to his death, they abandoned him. But after his death, they couldn't resist him. What made the difference? The answer, the tomb was empty. And because Jesus rose from the dead, so will we. We are a resurrection people. Death has no victory over us. We can look our ancient enemy, death, straight in the eye and say, I'm not scared of you. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? 
The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christians don't stay in the tomb when they die. Our bodies do, but our bodies are just a shell. Who we are as followers of Christ never dies. And that's a great promise. But I want to talk about how we can be like Jesus while we're alive on this earth. And I want to challenge us that not only was the tomb empty, but Jesus himself was empty during his life on earth. And we need to emulate Jesus. Scripture tells us, sure, that he was full of a lot of things. Luke 10, 21 tells us that he was full of joy. Luke 4 tells us that he was full of power. John 1, 14 tells us he was full of grace and truth. And we know, we know those scriptures that tell us of other things he was full of, wisdom, compassion, love. We know he was full of the Holy Spirit. But this morning, I want to look at his emptiness and how we too need to be empty. So turn with me, please, to Philippians chapter 2. This portion of scripture is often known as the Christ hymn. It's also known as the kenosis hymn. Kenosis is a Greek word, and it means emptying. And that's the word used here in Philippians 2. I'm going to read Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Thousands upon thousands of books and sermons have been written about these 11 verses. But today I just want to highlight two points. Notice it starts with the sentence, have this mind among you. Your version may say, have this disposition or have this same attitude. And that's what Paul means. Christ had this attitude and so should we. So what's the attitude? Well, the attitude is one of a servant. That's the hallmark of Christ's attitude. Verse 7 says it's the hallmark of his kenosis, of his emptying. Christ emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. So that was the physical expression, Christ coming to earth to serve. His attitude, it goes on to say, was displayed in two ways. And it's those two ways that you and I can emulate. First, he humbled himself. Christ the King, God, sovereign of the universe, humbled himself to become a man. That word humble is the Greek word to pinaho, and the emphasis of the meaning is to be devoid of all haughtiness and to behave without pride. And of course, we see that in Jesus throughout his entire life. And certainly as we've read the events of his last week on earth, leading up to the crucifixion story, we certainly see how he lived humbly. Well, if we are to empty ourselves and have the same attitude or the same mind as Christ, we need to ask ourselves, do we humble ourselves? Are we continuing, continually swallowing this desire to puff ourselves up and make ourselves better than we really are? Because that's pride. That's not being humble. Do we ever demand our rights? Do we ever say to ourselves, this is not what I deserve. I deserve better. Well, is that the attitude of humility? I'm not saying that we need to walk around debasing ourselves, putting ourselves down, and living a life that, you know, I'm nothing but a lowly worm. That's not it at all. That's not what I'm saying. True humility shows up in our attitudes, our words, and our actions when we continually consider other people, when we prefer them, when we recognize their value. After all, Christ died for them too. And when we see ourselves as servants of God, think of humility 
as the activity around a throne. There's someone sitting on the throne and there's someone attending to the person sitting on the throne. Which are you? So Christ emptied himself to be a servant first by humbling himself and secondly by being obedient. Verse 8 says, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now that's obedient. And I don't imagine many of us, and I pray 